Troy University's Hall School of Journalism and Communication presents the 2017 M. Stanton Evans Symposium on Money, Politics, and the Media. The guest speaker for the symposium is co-founder and chief trial counsel of the Southern Poverty Law Center, Morris Dees. The symposium, held in the Trojan Center ballrooms on the Troy campus, is introduced by the director of the Hall School, Dr. Jeff Spurlock. Good morning and welcome to the 2017 Journalism Symposium, Politics, Media, and Money. This is named in honor and in memory of M. Stanton Evans. Stan Evans was an endowed chair and endowed professor here at Troy who's, who uh, taught here for well over 20 years and who passed away a couple of years ago this month. But this is the 2017 symposium and we are so honored to have all of you here. I'm Jeff Spurlock, I'm the director of the School of Journalism and Communication here at Troy. And I want to again welcome you to this festivity, this event. And I want to thank so much the Hall School of Journalism faculty and staff for their contributions in making this event possible. But most importantly, I would like to uh, single out Mr. Steve Stewart. Steve is the uh, orchestrator of this, this event. So let's give Steve a, a hand. So <laughs> At this time, it is my honor to introduce my boss, Larry Blocker, who is the Dean of the College of Communication and Fine Arts. Dr. Blocker. Good morning. I want to begin by thanking you for being here this morning and as a part of our annual journalism symposium. I also want to welcome and thank our Senior Vice Chancellor and our special guest speaker for being with us today. If you ever take a minute to visit the Troy homepage for the Hall School of Journalism, among the many things you will find there is a welcome from Director Jeff Spurlock. In this welcome, Dr. Spurlock states that college is often about opportunities, about students having the opportunity to make decisions. All of you, all of us, make decisions each day in a world that is constantly changing. Change is inevitable. Strategic, productive change is not. Reaching consensus on how to change, when to change, and what to do with all this change can be really challenging. Good journalism, at least in part, should help us answer those questions. This morning is a time to think. It's a time to listen, a time to continue to gather information as a basis for informed decision making. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Dew, Senior Vice Chancellor for Student Services and Administration at Troy University. Thank you, Dean Blocker, and thank you so much, Dr. Spurlock, and for the faculty for their leadership. Uh, to all of the faculty, staff, and the many students who are assembled here, and to all of the guests from across the wiregrass that are here to, to listen to our speaker this morning, let me say welcome on behalf of our Chancellor, Dr. Jack Hawkins, and the members of the Board of Trustees of Troy University. It's a great pleasure to be able to uh, support this Stanton Evans Symposium. We want to also take a moment to recognize the hard work of the faculty in terms of developing a nationally ranked program in journalism. And kudos to all the students who had participated and done so much to win uh, regional recognition in terms of uh, journalism, in terms of competition with other universities. Now at Troy University, I will remind all the students that we talk a lot about leadership. We have a special program in leadership. And um, you know, leadership is about a lot of different things, but part of it is about recognizing a need when something needs to be done and coming up with a vision and having the courage to be able to fulfill that vision, uh, to challenge systemic injustice where it may be found. And so I, th I think for all of you who are students here today, uh, I think you're in for a real treat in terms of the opportunity to listen to a real leader who has helped transform this country. And I predict that you will remember this presentation and you will remember this moment probably for the rest of your lives. And so I, I celebrate the fact that we're able to create this opportunity for you. And with that, let me s yield the floor to Mr. Steve Stewart, who will have the honor of introducing our speaker. Uh, 
Thank you, Dr. Dew. I want to thank a lot of people who have helped put together this event, including the staff of the Southern Poverty Law Center, the students, faculty, staff, and administration of the Hall School of Journalism and Communication, a lot of other folks here at Troy University, and the members of the student organization called Student Advocacy for Free Expression. Somebody asked why we'd invite a civil rights lawyer to speak at a journalism symposium. Well, first, journalism, journalism is about everything, not just how to write. And this event is not strictly about journalism. It's about money, politics, and the media. We want to explore issues and hear from people who are making a difference. The invitation to Morris Dees resulted from the fact that 50 years ago, he represented a Troy student in a case that made a difference. Gary Dickey was an editor of the Tripolitan. Troy State College censored an editorial that Gary wrote. Ironically, the editorial was about freedom of expression. <laughs> the college expelled Gary, and he hired Morris Dees as his lawyer. The result was a federal court order from Frank Johnson, the famous civil rights judge, affirming student journalists' right to express themselves. I have thanked Mr. Dees for winning that case. I'm the Tripolitan faculty advisor now, and I don't want the job of censoring the TROP. I've never been asked to censor the TROP. But good journalists have more in common with good lawyers than a particular case from a long time ago. Both lawyers and journalists seek the truth. They support freedom of expression and human rights. They enable people to make good decisions and to control their own destinies. Mr. Dees and his organization are courageous and effective advocates and defenders for those who are mistreated, marginalized, and disadvantaged. He's a native Alabamian who challenges the prevailing assumptions. He pushes us to see the value in all people to make society fairer and to live up to what we learned in church and elsewhere. Journalists are in the business of telling true stories. We can benefit from the advice that Mr. Dees wrote for young lawyers. This is what he said. Learn your client's story, then fit the story into the bigger picture of what we believe in as a people and a nation. Lift the jurors, the jurors above the simple facts of the case and give them a chance to render a decision that will be a part of our history of justice and fairness. I think he's one of those good lawyers who are natural allies of good journalists. I'm honored to introduce to you Morris Dees, co-founder and chief trial counsel of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Well, normally, I wouldn't be cheering for Troy in a sports event, but I watched Troy play Duke, and I was really pulling for Troy, I promise you. And every time they made a score, I thought they should get two scores, because I wanted Duke beat, and finally they got beat. You know, I, I, I'm really honored to be here today. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about coming down and talking to so many of you who are tied into journalism and journalism-related subjects. Because I, I started off at Lanier High School in Montgomery with the Crimson White and, and wrote a column. I can't remember a thing about it. But then I got to the University of Alabama and I, I started writing for the, the newspaper there and had a, co a politics column on politics and that lasted a while. So I really am strongly attached to the whole area of journalism. But, you know, I, I grew up in many ways, like so many of you here today. My multiple great-grandfather was the first sheriff of this county. Uh, he came in from Virginia and on down, and I got a long letter he wrote that my mother ended up with talking about talking about Pike County. And then my Dee's family all settled around Pine Level, and that's why Red Schoolhouse, probably many of you know, is run by Dee's people. So they, they all did well. 
And so I feel, I feel really attached to this county. In fact, I was down here about four weeks ago getting plum trees over at the farmer's co-op, and they're beautiful trees, and I, I think that they're going to do well. So I like this county, and I like these people. A lot of people grew up in, in, in areas. John Lewis, the congressperson, uh, was born in this county, been a friend for years, and helped us found the Southern Poverty Law Center. I was raised in <clears throat> Mount Meigs, Alabama, which is really, I was born in Shorter, which is Macon County, and raised around Mount Meigs, Alabama. And it, it, was a, it was a wonderful, wonderful little community. And I was riding down here today, I was looking to the right and left sides of the road, seeing little villages and communities that really no longer exist today. They remind me of growing up in Pike Road, Alabama, and Mount Meigs. And that was a small school there. It was, uh, you know, just uh, probably 85 students who went to the first through the 12th grade. They closed the 12th grade before I got there and took us to Lanier, but I started there and early on, and, and I had a teacher there at Pike Road School that made a lot of difference in my life. The church that I went to, the Baptist church, was next door to the school, and back then it was hard to tell the school from the church. It was pretty similar. And she was also a Sunday school teacher in my school. And she would take the students out in front of the school, along with the other classes, in the morning, and we would raise the flag. The gravel road ran by there, and they raised the flag, and, and we would all repeat the Pledge of Allegiance. And I remember some words that stuck with me from that Pledge of Allegiance. One nation with liberty and justice for all. I made that speech once, and somebody said, well, aren't you supposed to put under God in there? But that wasn't in it in 1948, and I was 12 years old. That didn't happen until Eisenhower put it in. But that's what, that's, that's what the words she said was, one nation with liberty and justice for all. And we got back in the classroom, and she was, Ms. This teacher, uh, Mrs. Vera Bell Johnson, was uh, a nice woman, and she was single, and she didn't take political stands like might today, but she knew that things weren't really fair going on with the way black people and even some poor people, white people, were treated. And she said in her own way, and I think it influenced me for a lifetime, don't forget that this nation was set up for the benefit of all of us. One nation with liberty and justice for all. Now, when I'm 12 years old then, and I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be able to, to do with this great information, and, and when I got 16, 17, I graduated, I, I wanted to be a lawyer, and, but that was another man who was from our community who, who did take a stand. His name was a Reverend Martin Luther King in Montgomery. I wasn't involved in the civil rights movement. In fact, my daddy was a very fair person. He had a little small cotton gin. He had some brothers who were pretty, pretty racist. I mean, two of them belonged to the Klan, but my daddy didn't. And the African-American farmers liked him, and they ginned their cotton with him, and so did the whites. And he, he just, uh, uh, you know, didn't, didn't have any civil rights movements or anything about him. But he was just a, a fair man. My mother was a justice of the peace. She wasn't a lawyer, but that was a, a good way for me to get a chance to, to look at what lawyers, lawyers do, at least people who get in trouble. But Dr. King, different. He's a man who had to face many of his contemporaries a lot of them African-Americans with little vision. He had to face politicians without courage, and many of them weren't necessarily just from the South. And finally, he faced a terrorist, a killer, with no conscience. And Dr. King in Washington, D.C., made a famous talk and a couple lines stuck with me from that talk. He said that uh, America, there are lonely islands of poverty and injustice in this vast ocean of opportunity. 
And today, there are people in this country who are receiving no justice or opportunity. Now, I didn't come down here to make a political speech. Uh, I voted and my candidate didn't win. Some of your candidates won. And that's a temporary thing. It may be last long. Who knows what will happen. But that what happened is important and what's happening is important to journalists in this country. Because we have a president who basically got elected against his own party's best wishes because he said the journalists were all liars and cheaters and crooks and they didn't tell the truth. And, and I was on, on my exercise machine this morning and I see where the Wall Street Journal came out and, and he just said he's flat out lying and not telling the truth. Now that's the Wall Street Journal, you know, and it's paper I don't read a lot, but that gum at the Wall Street Journal and they ask a, a Trump aide, they said, well, what do you say about the Wall Street Journal saying that? And he said, well, just another one of them lying newspapers. Well, it's, un honestly, it wasn't a lying newspaper. It was a, a very prestigious journal in this country that has, had supported Republicans and Democrats, too, for years. And, you know, I, I was, as I was watching, I was thinking, what's going on in this country? Why, why did we have the election that we did? And I guess you have to say, and Dr. King would agree, and so many other civil rights leaders, Jimmy Carter, Clinton, Bush, and so many others, that the march for justice continues. It didn't end with the death of Dr. King, and it didn't end with so many other things that happened, the Voting Rights Act and others. It didn't end there. And let's just look at some of these issues that the March for Justice contains. We got one of the big ones right on top, LGBT rights. And you know, you might think, well, uh, that wasn't an issue that Dr. King had much to do with, and I certainly didn't when I came along. But that's a big issue today, and it involves itself in so many little nuances that it, it's, it's not decided yet, and maybe some things have. The Supreme Court just made some good rulings on that. And then you've got issues of mass incarceration. Uh, everybody's got a different take on that, but so many of the inmates in our prisons are locked up, but they didn't do any hard, violent crimes. They simply were dealing with drugs one way or another, and so we lock them up, and that's about all we can do. It's expensive. And you've got the whole issue of health care. Uh, you know, Obama passed a health care law, Clinton tried to, but the first person that brought up a health care law was Eisenhower. And Lyndon Johnson tried to get one passed. It's just a difficult issue, and those of us who have good health care, you know, it's, we can look against those who don't have it, and I guess we could say, well, if they, you know, were successful like me, they'd have health care, but they're not. And so you get a lot of negative attitude there, but health care is an important issue. And you look at countries like Canada and England and Cuba and other places where they worked it out and apparently make getting it done. And then you've got issues like, uh, gosh, I just can, just so many of them that show you that the March for Justice continues and it brings forth a lot of controversy. One of the big issues is the whole issue of immigration. And that issue is the big issue. It probably had a lot to do with the vote that we had in the United States this year. And the reason it's a big issue, and it's gonna be a big issue for a long time, is because we live in a changing America. A changing America. When I was born in Macon County in 1936, and December 16th is my birthday, and I was 80 years old, I was looking back at those years when I was born and just thinking, what was America like when I was born then? Well, 15% of the population in the United States was non-white. 
85 percent of people like me and the rest of us, we control this country. And I was born in Macon County with 90 percent African Americans, and they didn't vote except a few people, not many. So I lived in a strange world, but the population was the difference. Amazing change. Today, 37 percent of the people in the United States are non-white, are, are people of color. 37 percent, that's a big jump. And those numbers are growing because people like myself and so many of you, a population rate is lower and people of color have a higher population rate, younger, ambitious, and by the year 2040, or some number right there, demographers tell us that people of color will control this United States politically. Well, that causes a lot of issues with those people who have the political and the economic power. And at the Southern Poverty Law Center, we have been projecting that we're going to see a lot of situations like the election we just saw. Could last two more years, four more years, who knows, until things really change. I, I want to take you back, though, to a case that I had that when I took the case, it was unpopular. I was unpopular and my lawyers were getting involved. We didn't have journalistic support, but the people we represented were great people. And history has made a change. The Vietnam War had ended. And the United States, having lost its first war, migrated a half a million Vietnamese people to the United States. And many of them came to an angry country. <clears throat> we lost the war. The North and the South Vietnamese looked alike. And so people didn't really trust them. But they came as guests to our country. The Catholic Church and others settled them all over the country. And 50,000 were settled in the Houston, Texas area. And when these people got here, they didn't come on welfare. They came to work hard, and they went to work, brought their families, all had green cards. And they took over all kinds of businesses quickly, whether it be the florist business, restaurants, landscaping, automobile repair, you name it. And a very small group of them decided that they wanted to go into shrimping business, about 50 of them. They had been shrimping in the warm waters around Saigon Harbor and, and doing well. And they didn't have money to buy the big boats that the American shrimpers had. There were about 800 American boats down there in that area that cost anywhere from $100,000 to $400,000. And so these Vietnamese pooled their little monies together and bought broken down boats for a few thousand dollars each. They fixed them up. And they went out to f do shrimping and fishing, and they did really, really good. In fact, as maybe no other way to put it, but the American fishermen became jealous because these people worked hard. And they sorted their shrimp to get the best prices and just, just dump them all in a bowl. And so the, Vietnam, the American Fishermen Association goes to the Texas legislature and says, pass a law eliminating these immigrants having the right to fish. These are our waters and our fish. Well, the Texas legislature in its wisdom says no. This is a free enterprise country, and they don't, you know, with the fish, they belong to the waters, and, uh, and these are friends. We can't pass that law. Well, that didn't set well with a group of, of uh, American fishermen, a small portion, but it was a nasty little group. And so they turned to the world's oldest continuing existing terrorist group, to try to frighten these 50 Vietnamese people into selling their boats and leaving. And that was the Texas Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, run by a man who was a retired military guy, can't get meaner than him. And they set about to harass and threaten these Vietnamese. They burned several of their boats. They couldn't catch who did it, but they burned several of their boats, and people knew what was going on. They threatened. Americans, if you let these Vietnamese park their boats at your dock, we're going to burn your dock and your house, too. Well, that frightened these Vietnamese, so they, they decided that 
through the leaders in the community, they'd put their boats up for sale. They'd leave. They just, they'd do something else. Well, somebody contacted us and I flew down and met with a lawyer that represented them in real estate transactions. And I said, you know, maybe we can go to federal court and maybe we can get a court order to stop the American fishermen from harassing you, and particularly the Klan. And they, they were nervous about it. They were afraid. They had their homes in little cottages along the waters, and they didn't want anybody hurt. But they agreed to go along. And as I talked to Nguyen Van Nam, the leader of the Vietnamese fishermen, we walked among the boats with for sale signs in them, just little tiny boats rocking in the water along the dock. And, and he, he, he said, can you keep these people from harming our people? I said, I don't know. Maybe we can. I didn't have any help from the police. They didn't much like these people anyway. Didn't have much help from the news media, just a story or two there, yonder. And, they, and, they, and I think they didn't know where they should take a stand for the Vietnamese or just keep their mouth shut, so they kept their mouth shut. Well, we, we filed a federal lawsuit in federal court representing the Vietnamese fishermen. And I'll have to tell you, I began to get a little help. The FBI snuck me a file which talked about some of the Vietnamese, uh, I mean, the Klan leaders, and that was helpful. And, and also I found a couple of American fishermen who were courageous. They said we were threatened they'd burn our house and our dock, but I like the Vietnamese. They, they're good people. I've been in their homes. They fish hard. They work hard. And so they testified for us, along with others. And we put on a very good case. The federal judge ended, after a week's trial, ended a ruling in favor of the Vietnamese and against about a dozen American fishermen and Klan leaders. And that made the Vietnamese very happy. In fact, they gave us a nice map of the country and, and had a dinner for us and invited us to come down to the blessing of the fleet, the day that they were going to open up the shrimping season. I go to, down to Kemer, Texas, which is not far from Houston, and I was down there at about, I guess it was five in the morning. The sun had not come up yet. The fog was hanging heavy over the bay where Clear Creek Channel is, where you go out into the waters. And that was about 75 or 100 or so Vietnamese family members at the dock to welcomed the boats as they went out one by one. A Catholic priest was there to, to bless the boats as they went out. We didn't, we didn't see any boats for a while, and finally we heard a, a little bit of a noise coming out, an engine sounding, and the boat came by the dock, and the priest blessed that boat, and then another, and then another, until about 15 boats had gone out into the open waters. The sun began to, to burn through the fog, and as I looked to my right and my left, I could see so much pride in these family members. I saw the United States Marshals' badges gleaming in the sun because they'd been sent there by the court to make sure that this court order was carried out. And these family members were so proud because they were finding a place at America's table. I felt proud not only to be the lawyer, but I felt proud also to be an American. And as I stood there that morning, I thought about this nation. I thought about the railroads that were built across this country with Chinese workers high death rate as they cut through the granite Sierra Nevadas to tie one side of the country to the other. People who had no jobs back home but came here to work. And when they finished their work, Congress passed the law saying that no Chinese person coming for this could become a citizen of the United States. Well, that law changed. They became citizens, and they became great, great citizens. And as I stood there that morning, I thought about African Americans who came here, mostly in slave ships, and treated horribly for so long. 
and how they fought and fought and fought. And some people fought for them and some of us fought against them. But how they have changed this nation in so many ways and made us realize that that group of people is classic American citizens. I could go on and on naming the Irish who came, the people from Scotland who came, in different groups and different times. So many, so many, so many. Not trying to leave out any particular one, but all these people that came did not come in a popular situation. When the Irish came, some were lynched on the streets of Boston and Philadelphia and New York for taking American jobs because they didn't consider these people who couldn't even speak English, spoke Gaelic, they didn't consider them white people like the British and others. You know, and as I sit and think about what we face today in this country, I have to urge each of you, especially journalism students, to realize the big piece of this pie that you have. The United States Constitution was put together with a lot of turmoil. And it didn't even include a Bill of Rights. And it didn't even include the rights of women to vote, no African Americans to vote or even be citizens. It didn't include all that. And we had to have the first Bill of Rights passed, and the first bill, the first one, you all know it, the First Amendment deals with freedom of the press. And to have an elected official of this country condemn the press is almost like demagoguery, because that's what demagogues do, tear down the press and the leadership. But that won't last long. It didn't last long with Joe McCarley and McCarthy, and it didn't last with others, and it won't last here either. It may be tumultuous for a time. The biggest thing that I see personally is bad judges being appointed, and that may, may happen. That's just the way life is. But a lot of the judges appointed by Republicans have been some of the best judges that we had. I look at the court now, and we've won some important decisions this last term with Republican-appointed judges ruling for what's right. So I don't know how that'll go. I'm not, I'm concerned, but not, I'm not going to, nothing I can do much about it. But at the Southern Poverty Law Center, we're trying to take a stand in areas that make a difference. We're going to file a lawsuit, I can't tell you, but it's going to be filed on April the 10th. I don't want to name the group we're suing, but it's the largest internet hate group in America. And the leader of the group is a hardcore, far-right Republican leader, and they've been trouncing, trouncing a Jewish family in a small town for no good reason at all. And we've had lawyers working on this case now for about a month, and we're gonna file a lawsuit, and it should make a difference. But in addition, lawyers at the Southern Poverty went over recently in Atlanta when our president passed a law which judges held was illegal, but it, while they did it, they were arresting people as they came into the airport, and we got six people released and put on the way. And then we were down in Mississippi, and uh, one of the young women who came in this country when she was seven years old and was allowed by President Obama to get a college education, probably never intended to leave, well, she made a speech at a little ceremony, and she was arrested on the way home by, they call it ICE today, it used to be the Immigrant Reserve. They arrested her and, and put her in a prison and she's just a hard-working student. And, it was, and we got her out. We filed a motion, and the, and the court allowed her to come home. These are small things. But also, we're doing other things that don't necessarily tie into who happens to be president. It ties into this 
ever-changing demographics of America. We're still in all these title loan, small loan places that get four and five hundred percent interest from poor people. Maybe and maybe we can't not. They have more lobbyists in Alabama and other states than some of the big businesses do. It's a, it's a lucrative business. We're also trying to stop bail companies, bail bond companies, who take people who sit in jail because they get, can't get a $500 bond up because they had uh, no driver's license or whatever, because it, it served no real purpose. But they also have a big lobby. We're fighting for the whole issue of LGBT students across the country. Our case is on in Alabama, totally. Southeast, totally. We won a case in New Jersey where it said that a court ruled that you cannot advertise to a group of young people who happen to be gay that give me $10,000, mom and daddy, and we'll turn your gay son straight. Well, the court ruled that that was illegal. You couldn't do that. And it just violated the law. Some people might think so. Some may not. And we just finished a case in Minnesota, in this district out there, where four kids had committed suicide because the school was horribly biased against gays and lesbians. And we won a big case. And about 20 people got lots of money. I say lots of money. They got forty or $50,000 each. And then, then the federal court ordered the school to revamp its entire program, and it did. And it did make a difference. So these are not simple little things. We have a program called Teaching Tolerance. And it, we have 100,000 schools in America that use our material. And this material is put together and sent free of charge because many of you here support our work. I know that. And this, we've had all kinds of bias in classrooms where African-American students tell a teacher with tears they're going to kill me because they've been threatened to be killed by other students. Asian students worried about whether they're going to be exported to another country. There's so many, so many, much bias and prejudice. And this material that we sent out is high quality, good material. If you come to Montgomery, come to the Civil Rights Memorial Center across from our offices, and you can see the documentary films and things that we have. And we supply them free to schools all over the United States, some seven, eight million dollars annually. The Southern Poverty Law Center doesn't charge for its work. It gets its contributions from individuals. You know, you know, the question is, what's the solution? What's the, what's the solution to the problem? I'm not sure that I can lay you out a simple solution. Maybe other than to say, and maybe there's no other way to say it, it's just called reconciliation and forgiveness. Reconciliation and forgiveness. I learned that in that little Baptist church and in Pike Road, Alabama, and it helped me along the way. But I had a client that represented the epitome of reconciliation and forgiveness. Mrs. Beulah Mae Donald's 19-year-old son was picked up off the streets of Mobile, taken out, in the woods and killed and lynched and hung in a tree in downtown Mobile. He was an honest, honest hardworking young man who was going to night school to learn masonry and worked at the Mobile Press Register. And he didn't do anything to cause his death. He simply happened to be on the street where a couple of Klansmen was trying to make a show of Klan strength. And it took several years to catch them, and they were convicted. One went to, actually was executed, a white, the first white to executed for killing an African-American in Alabama's history that we can record. 
And the other one was, they were 17, 18 years old when it happened, but the 17-year-old one testified against him and got a life prison sentence. We sued the entire Klan organization. They had a big headquarters in Birmingham, I mean, Tuscaloosa, and they had chapters in 30 states around America. We sued the whole group because we wanted to show that that organization put these people up to doing this, and we proved our case. And this young man who was serving a federal sentence, a life sentence, testified for us at the civil trial. And he said that his men did what they did because of the Klan leadership sitting at that table. Mrs. Donald was sitting at our table watching this, an elderly woman, not great health. As those six white jurors listened to that trial, then something strange happened. Klan lawyer made his closing argument, I made my closing argument, and the Klan leader, James Knowles, decided that he didn't have a lawyer. The Klan did have a good lawyer, but he didn't, and he wanted to speak to the jury. Well, the judge got us all together, and we agreed that he could speak to the jury, and he stood there in front of that jury and said, ladies and gentlemen, what I did was wrong. I want you to rule against myself and all these other people to stop this from happening. He said a few more things. He was not a real educated man. And he looked down at Mrs. Donald and said, Ms. Donald, and he started crying. I thought the judge was going to give him a chance to regain his composure and he cleared his throat, though, and said, Ms. Donald, can you forgive me for what I did to your son? And she kind of rocked back in her chair and stood there, and she said, I've already forgiven you. There wasn't a dry eye at our council table. In that jury box, and I saw that old judge brush back a tear. This dear woman was full of reconciliation and forgiveness. That's what the solution is. And that reconciliation and forgiveness becomes, is because ultimately the facts have to be made clear. And short-term politics won't survive the long-term push for justice. Dr. Martin Luther King made many speeches and a line that he used coming from the book of Amos that was given out at a time when the Jewish people were having problems. Amos was a farmer and a prophet. And he made this speech, and Dr. King picked up on it, and it's what we have on the walls of the Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery. He says, let us not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you for coming. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope that I hope that you can stay for Q and A. We got some very talented Q and A and, uh, experts over here. <laughs> We're going to move the curtain back so we can put a so we can get up on the stage so you can have a chance to listen, and you may have some questions. Uh, 
I see some students maybe having to go for some other reasons, but whatever it is, I know they want you to stay. And if you come to Montgomery, please, thank you, please come by the Southern Poverty Law Center and it costs little or nothing to see the Civil Rights Memorial and it's well, well worth your time. And add your name to the wall of tolerance. Add your name to the wall of tolerance. There were a million names there on a digital wall and your name will appear there. So I'm gonna go up on stage now. I'm uh, Dr. Susan Serapin. I teach uh, mass media law for uh, the uh, Hall School of Journalism and Communication. And we're gonna have a little Q&A here. Uh, I've no never led one of these, but uh, we've got experts over here. Uh, please know that you can also send a question in on Twitter, um, hashtag Troy Justice. So we're gonna have some people monitoring Twitter for your questions. And I think we are going to start off with a question from Tori Bedsell. Would you like to ask your question? Oh, let me invite you, please. If you have a question, there are two microphones right there in the center aisle. Just uh, work your way up to one of those and uh, we'll take your questions. Um, what do you feel is the most pressing issue facing society today? The most pressing issue facing society today. Are my dice going to come up 11 or 7? <laughs> <laughs> I roll my dice every morning. <laughs> I didn't learn that in the Baptist church either. <laughs> pressing issues facing America today. Uh, I don't think there is a one pressing issue. It's just that we all have different backgrounds. We all came from different places. I don't think John Lewis ever thought he'd be chasing chickens around a small farm in Pike County and later become a leader in the United States Civil Rights Movement and the United States Congress. Each of you have a background. You may be studying journalism. You may end up teaching school. Who knows what you might do and what y'all might do. So I think, I think what's important is what's important to the world you live in and things you can affect. If you're working in children's rights, that may be an important issue. So I think we just can't pull out one issue and just say that, well, I'm gonna watch Fox News or CNN or somebody else and try to make my mind up because it really isn't a reality television lifestyle we have. Um, and my question for you is, in the story that you told us about the Vietnamese fishermen, um, you mentioned courageous fishermen, uh, courageous American fishermen that stepped up and said, you know, they appreciated the Vietnamese, they liked having those people around. How essential do you think are courageous individuals to your work? <clears throat> well, there's no replacing those individuals who are courageous, whether it's Thomas Paine who decided that he was going to write something and take a strong stand early on in the history of this nation, along with other founding women and men in America, to an individual who decides that he sees a, a building burning and he walks by the street and sees it and decides that I'm going to go in there quick as I can and warn everybody to get out. So they're courageous people everywhere, everywhere, Sarah, doing things that, that make a difference. We've had, we have, we had cases that we could not have ever won without those people who were on the side of hate who were members of a hate group, the neo-Nazi groups and others, who decided after talking with us that they'd made a big mistake. And they wanted to testify for what the truth was and put those people who led them that way either in prison or under a big judgment or out of business. So it all depends on who you are and where you are. There's no one simple little solution answer. Well, I invite you to step up to the microphone if you have a question. What is your question? I'm Nathaniel Rodriguez. I'm a broadcast major here. And my question was um, that with this whole fake news debacle that's constantly being brought out now, um, you know, I, I follow the president on Twitter, and every time I wake up, there's not a tweet without fake news in there somewhere. I don't think I've woken up a morning without seeing that word. And um, 
do you think that it is sort of spilling through to people who do support him very hardcore, but do you think it's starting to become more and more of a problem, or is it something that might just be a trend now and will just go away with the time? Because it is a little bit concerning when you're having people call legitimate reporters who are just reporting the facts, literally having documentation and saying it's fake news. And at that point, well, what's, what's real? <laughs> if the facts aren't real, then what is? Well, first of all, I think you made a nice statement, and I, I think I feel what you're feeling, too. Uh, I mean, that, I mean, that news all over the place. You know, the uh, bulletin boards in the Boston Commons were, had things posted on them by individuals who some might have been true, some might not have been true. But that was the whole idea behind the First Amendment, keep the bulletin boards open for people to express their opinions. But the population in general has to take a whole look at everything and decide, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to believe? And what it takes is not just a good education, but dealing with people who are broad-minded and can look at all the different news information and, and, and make their own mind up. Uh, you got awards given out by the Associated Press, United Press International, so many organizations. And I've been to some of those things, and they scrutinize individuals with their stories that have exposed all kinds of corruption and violence and just bad things in our country. There's nothing fake about those stories. They're real stories. And if you, if you uh, decided that you're going to gain yourself some political power by saying, well, all the news media, television, newspapers, what, that's all fake. Well, you know, it doesn't take smart people long to figure out the only fake person is the person saying that. And it's not gonna, it's not gonna be a thing that'll bring America to its knees. We've gone through bad times in the past. We had the brown shirts, the Nazis in our country in the 30s, and we've had Joe McCarthy, and we've had all the different things that happened in this nation. And we've overcome them all. It certainly is a price to pay, especially when you have a question of how you're going to allocate the dollars and cents you have to take care of a, a country. That's what the real issues are. And, and, and they're, they're not fake issues. They're real issues. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that question. That's a good question. Justin, do you have a question for uh, Mr. Dees? I do. My name is Justin Blowers. I'm a multimedia journalism major. Uh, recently, uh, former Alabama Representative Richard Laird said at a Judiciary Commission meeting, committee meeting that there is a uh, racial disparity in the prisons, but they chose to be there, uh, implying that the only reason there is a racial disparity is because certain races commit more crimes than others. Well, you know, I, I wish I was an expert on this whole issue of race relations and people who commit more crimes than others in prisons themselves. Uh, I just can't answer your question. I don't do prison work. The Senate does some on mistreatment of prisoners for medical conditions, but the inter, inter workings of a prison and the race, race and ethnic backgrounds of the individuals in there, that's just above me. But I thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, according to the FBI, that um, it says that there are a lot of hate groups that have infiltrated law enforcement. And I just want to know that um, what would the Southern Poverty Law Center do about this, or what did he plan on doing about this to prevent this from happening in the future, especially in light of police shootings of African Americans and minorities in this country? Okay. Uh we track hate groups all over the country, as you can. They don't go to the Chamber of Commerce and fill out a we're in town card. <laughs> and so we, there are about 900 or 1,000 hate groups increased substantially in the last three months, actually, about 100 new ones. Uh, I don't know of a hate group that is affiliated with the police department in America. There may have been times when they didn't have to be because the police departments in the Southeast and some other kinds went along with them. Uh, there are members of those police agencies that are involved with hate groups. 
And it's, normally, as soon as they find out, they, they get rid of the individual. I've actually, uh, we've been a part of providing that information. We found out through undercover people where some police officers are involved in South Carolina and in other areas, and they fired these people. Two in Alabama, one was a lieutenant. So I would like to think that law enforcement in general, and obviously that specific thing, are not big promoters of hate groups as they were in the South in the 50s. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is Michael Shipma. I'm a multimedia major here. And my question for you was, from a law standpoint, um, it seems that journalists are having to fight more and harder to gain access to information that in the past they've been able to obtain pretty easily. Um, from, a, from a law standpoint, what sort of tools are available to journalists to use to gain that access and to maintain their credibility um, and to get the information that they need to get out to the people? You know, uh, I thought I understood it right. You know, there's all kind of freedom of information things you can file with law enforcement agencies to get information. Sometimes it's not always as forthcoming as you might like, or they may not even keep the information. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center trains law enforcement all over the country on how to recognize hate uh, symbols and signs and hate groups. And in and, and the old-fashioned claim, they, they don't much exist anymore because we've put 12 major ones out of business. The Internet's taken it over. Today you've got the digital world and the largest Internet hate site that we're fixing to sue might not have 10 members but they might have 400,000 people that post on it. So it's, it's difficult to, to, to really answer your question specifically. I just think it takes investigative journalists willing to go into police departments, talk to victims of crimes, talk to law enforcement who've dealt with these crimes, and try to uncover the problem. It's, there's no really organization you can go to to get what you really would think you should. But thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Kimberly Spillers. <clears throat> I'm a junior broadcast journalism major. And with the March for Justice Continues, you listed that the LGBT rights were important, the mass incarceration, health care, immigration. So I just wanted to ask you, do you think rape culture on campus is an issue that needs to be focused on as a civil right as well? There's a lot in the news media today about this whole issue of sexual assaults on college campuses. Uh, and th there's several versions. You, you obviously you got clear-cut violent rape where somebody is caught drug into a ditch or somewhere and, 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 and physically assaulted. And then you got situations where guys and girls are out somewhere drinking and, and, uh, or something and guys just take advantage of a girl who has no interest in the guy at all uh, I think every college has to, has its own, have to have its own rules and be willing to expose those individuals that, of, who are lying, both male and female. Uh, we've seen what happened uh, at several colleges. It turned out to be not the truth, and some turned out to be the truth. So do you have something you'd like to add? Oh, oh no. It just, I'm in Ms. Serapin's multimedia law class, and we're speaking about it, so I just figured it'd be nice to put, hear your input about it. Well, well, thank you for your question. Thank you. I just want to uh, ask a follow-up question to that, uh, and that's that there is rampant, you know, across the nation, a failure to file accurate Clary reports on sexual assaults on campuses, where universities have zero, z they report zero sexual assaults or just a couple. And um, it's being investigated, so I have found out. But, you know, how can we get the schools? They, they say they don't want to be known as the rape school. You know, if they, if they put the truthful uh, statistics about sexual assaults on their campus, they say nobody will come to, the, to school and they'll lose money. How can we get to the bottom of that? I had an opportunity to represent the uh, woman who claimed to have been raped at Florida State by the quarterback 
that I don't think Florida State wanted to get rid of. <laughs> he went on and become pretty famous. I don't know what he's doing now. I hadn't followed him. And that was a complicated case. Uh, there's no question that this woman had sex with somebody she didn't even know and didn't even recognize until she saw him 30 days later in a classroom. And, but what, what we didn't know was when it all came about, the police, the police sent somebody to talk to this young man, this famous quarterback, and filled him in on the story and, and then gave him a chance to come up with some excuse. Well, had they simply just broached him and said, did you have sex with this woman and never even approached him with anything, he probably would have said, heck no, I don't even know who she is. I didn't have sex with her. I didn't pick her up. I didn't do anything. But they gave him the whole story, so he came up with an excuse. And they, I don't know, there's a civil suit going now. I decided not to get involved. It's a little complicated. But uh, there's a civil suit that may have been settled by now. And life has moved on. Uh, it, I don't know that, and it may be true, but I don't know that a, a man or a woman would fail to go to a college if the college was open and honest about sexual assaults on a campus. Uh, it just, I just don't think so. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe y'all can tell me different. But, you know, people are human beings, and I don't care whether you go to Harvard or Yale or, or uh, Georgia State or Troy, wherever, people are going to be human beings wherever they are. And how they act in a college campus depends on the college leadership, excellent leadership, who stand up and both men and women leaders stand up and set good examples and be willing to talk about things in a way that women, especially women, will be trusting to confide in them things that are happening. And I wish I, wish I knew more how to answer your question, but that's about the best I can do. Good morning. Um, my name is Alex Collier. I'm multimedia. Would you speak loud and directly in the microphone? Okay, yes, sir. Um, my name is Alex Collier, and I'm a multimedia journalism major. My question was, um, with states like Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia known to be hateful states to minorities and hold their Confederate flags high um, in the sky along with their American flag, how far do you think reconciliation and forgiveness is away from states like Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia? Well, that's a good question based on the way I ended my talk with Mrs. Donald's story. Um, I think it's very important in those specific states you mentioned, but it's equally important throughout the whole United States. Washington, D.C. didn't integrate their things until the 50s. And the most violence we had in, outside of the Deep South was in Boston, Massachusetts, when they started integrating the schools. So I think, I think that we need some reconciliation for sure. Whether we can replicate what happened in South Africa, uh, you, you did, that was hard to know. When you had a, uh, people who've been in prison for years facing the people who put them there and having reconciliation, I don't know. Uh, it probably won't happen in the country, but what can happen in the country is dialogue between groups like this group here, like you standing there and others, openly talking about this. And I think it's important that you don't necessarily have to have campus-wide anything. If, if a fraternity or sorority or a civic club or a community group, church group, whatever, that can be small groups meeting and talking about these things on a regular basis. And I think that's, that's, that's important too. Thank you. Yes. My name is Chelsea. Um, I'm a junior broadcast journalism major here. And I have more of a personal question for you. Um, you've been a voice for so many people who didn't have a voice in this society. And um, my question is, did you face any type of violence or hate towards you? And if you did, then how did you get the courage to keep doing what you were, that you're doing now? Because in today's society, we see so much of blatant racism that goes on, that stuff that's little that nobody really wants to talk about or nobody wants to speak up for. So how did you get the courage to actually speak up for people? Well, thank you. Uh, there are about, <laughs> about 20 some people who, uh, have been in prison or 
been there and gotten out who had the idea that they wanted to end my life or life of somebody I'm working with. The Klan burned our building in 1984, and we caught the people involved, and they went to prison. So who knows what taking stands today will cause. We still get enormous amount of threats, uh, people getting caught for different things. I'm hoping all that's changed. But, you know, uh, when uh, I have a pool table in my house and, you know, and you can see through the big windows that's looking at the pool table and, and that guards walk around outside, you know. <laughs> I see one of them here now. <laughs> well, it's a different house. But <laughs> and my wife and I can't do things on a pool table we used to do because people looking through there. <laughs> So, so we just put some drapes up there, and I don't know. I, I I've never I've never actually failed to do something because of you know threats, and that nobody's ever quit the Southern Poverty Law Center. We have 250 employees because of threats, and you're gonna get these threats. You're not gonna stop them. Uh, I'm just I'm just happy that we have good protection. We have great law enforcement protection in, in this room as well as in Montgomery and around the nation. And most of the people in this nation, the great majority of the people, are peace-loving individuals who don't want other people hurt. So we'll do our best, and, uh, and I will call you if I need some help. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. <laughs> okay. That's it. Hey, I'm Michaela McCurry. I'm a communications major. And my question was, you said the solution to the problem is reconciliation and forgiveness. What would you say is the process to getting to that point? Yeah, well, that, we've had a couple of questions already on this reconciliation and forgiveness and the process to get into that. Uh, I don't know that there is a, like, book that you can go get. I'm sure there are <laughs> in the area that can open the door to how you do reconciliation. Most of the things that I think we got to deal with today in America are generally locally isolated, whether it's Troy or Union Springs or Montgomery or Alabama or in different regions. And each of these present different ways to deal with these issues. When you graduate from this school, I assume you're a student here. Mm -hmm. When you graduate <laughs> from here, you know, then and you move out into the job world, then you've got another issue to deal with. I want to say this, though, and until this issue is solved, America's got a problem. Uh, University of, I think, Pennsylvania, I'm pretty sure that's when it was, sent out several thousand job applications for jobs that were advertised in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, wanting college-educated, trained people for technical things. And all these job applications for those jobs they filed, they were all identical. In other words, they had the same background, the same references, the same everything. They were all fake applications. They weren't real. And there was then, half of them had a, a Latino or African-American name, Lakeisha Washington, as the person applying for the job. And the other half of them had Sarah Smith, a very Anglo-sounding name. Got some Sarahs up here. <laughs> Sorry, Sarah. Whatever. But anyway, they made it pretty clear. And, uh, but the applications were the same. And it was not surprising to the people who did this that the non-white, half of the non-white people got 50% fewer calls for further interviews. Now that's shocking because here, here is job recipients for big companies, big major companies deciding that they wanted to opt out for the white over the non-white. Now, that's always an issue. There are lawsuits about it. But that's a clear case of a test that was run where the person getting it had no idea what was happening, none whatsoever. And they were followed up by professional interviewers. And what's ironic was a lot of those human rights people working at these companies were African American picking a white person. Don't ask me why. But I think that there's a lot of work to be done, small, insignificant to some may mean, significant to others, 
It's very important. And I don't think a better place to start that is on a college campus because many of you in this room are going to go to work for companies and are going to be in a position to make a difference. Thank you. And I think that's about all the time we have for questions. Do we? I, I just have one question. Oh, okay. I have a question. My question yeah, is. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. I want to know uh, how you feel about uh, the effects of people such as Judge Roy Moore uh, defying federal decisions and Donald Trump denigrating judges. What kind of effect does that have on America? Well, there are people who probably think that uh, uh, Roy Moore is a, is a courageous person, and I'm sure in his own religious beliefs and things he is a courageous person because he says what he believes, but there's no place on a state Supreme Court or any judge here that simply says, I'm not going to rule a certain way because of this biblical quote right here. And it's just not going to do it. And if a federal judge rules the way, I'm going to tell Alabama lawyers and judges they don't have to honor this federal court, which is the highest court we have. When he put the monument in the uh, uh, Supreme Court lobby in Montgomery, it was a big, beautiful room about this size, he put uh, Ten Commandments at the rear end of it, stuff written all over it about different people. And, most of it was actually not even true, but it was there. We filed the lawsuit and we got it out, got the whole thing moved, and got him kicked off the bench, but he got reelected. And then he came back again and we filed another complaint that he was denigrating judges and he was kicked off again. And you know, the people that kicked him off though were other lawyers and people who were on the judicial panel. And so it wasn't some liberal civil rights group, it was pretty well people who want to follow the law. There are other judges in Alabama who condemn women or condemn poor people, and they get their coming up and from time to time. As far as the national scene goes, we have a president who recently lost uh, a case against five, six countries that have never had a terrorist act committed in America ever, and that was ruled unconstitutional in uh, the uh, federal court in California, and then it was going to be affirmed on appeal, and then he, he decided that he would withdraw that one, and then he filed another one, naming some more countries and adding some more stuff. Well, the president just doesn't have that authority, and so a federal court in Hawaii also ruled this one unconstitutional. Well, I think if I was a, a person responsible for appointing federal judges, I would just find judges who agree with my philosophy and got good educations and did go to court. He put a man up recently for add to the Supreme Court. And the man made a statement which I was shocked because he's got a great reputation as a well-educated guy. He got kind of a far-right background, but anyway, the guy was being questioned. He says, well, judges aren't political, conservative, or Democrat. If you're a Democrat or Republican, it doesn't matter you're going to still rule on the law right. And what I would like to know is, well, Obama put a guy up who was highly qualified, and he, they didn't even give him a hearing. So I don't think this new judge really believes what he said. He may have been told to say that. And I don't think that the people who put him up believe it at all. It's the best president's right to appoint a judge who has the same philosophy. It's OK, admit that. I'm, I got the philosophy of whoever put me up. But so I, I think it's important that the judicial system in America is certainly biased and prejudiced in many ways. But fortunately, we have the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and courts interpreting stuff. And it's amazing how many times, ultimately, those people who you would think would be against a certain right turn out in favor of it. So, you know, just keep your fingers crossed. Don't turn in your citizenship, and we'll all see each other next year.